and my name is Tina. I'm Jeff. B. Anderson. And we live in Lincoln. We've been coming, coming to Living Hope Church for one year this past November. Our grandson Noah invited us. Um, his girlfriend came first and she invited Noah and he started coming with her and Noah invited mom. Mom brought the other two kids and then Noah asked us after him and Rowan were baptized last August. This past November it was one year. Unlike any other church that I've ever been to, it's like when we walk in here and you feel the love as soon as you come in the door. And then when Janet and Keith and everybody is singing, it's like you just feel, it's it's overwhelming. You feel the love. So, it's, and that's something I've never experienced before. So. And it's made my faith stronger. I, I feel closer because I actually pay attention to the pastor when he's talking instead of my mind wandering. <laughs> so I feel closer to God. It has brought it has brought us closer. Um, for a while. Don and Michelle and the kids didn't come visit very much. We didn't get much communication with them. And now everything seems to be going better. The communication's better. We see them more often. And it's really made a huge impact on the kids. Um, I think it's brought Noah closer to us. And he's more understanding of things now, I think. Well, I refrain from things that I didn't before. And so it's things that I should have never been doing in the first place. And so, I mean, still it's like a long ways from being perfect, long, long ways long way to go, but I'm a lot better at plus. In me, I feel calmer. I feel more relaxed, more, um, more in control of my life, more in control of my faith. Awesome. That's my words exactly. <laughs> awesome. Um, nobody's alone. It's like, and that's what I've learned since I've been coming here. It's like, nobody's alone. For me, it would be the love of God, the love uh, that the pastor has for the congregation, the church, just the family. Well, today I was talking to someone in, about our church and I was explaining that it's not your normal, quiet, boring church. I mean, the old hymns are beautiful and wonderful, but the newer hymns, the, the band, it just, it brings everything to life. And the fact that the pastor has such a wonderful personality and they just need to come and check it out. You know, and the fact that you do everything on online afterwards, so if we yeah. miss a sermon, we can come, we can hear it. Yeah, we and we do have people listen, give them the link so that they can watch and they can make their own mind up. I'm Jeff. And I'm Tina. We are our living, living hope.
Hey guys, welcome and good morning to our first uh, coronavirus containment service. Uh, this is <coughs> a little bit different than what we're used to, of course. Uh, a little, little strange, a little different, but you know what? It's okay. I'm so thankful that in this season where social distancing is encouraged, um, I am so thankful that God has given us the opportunity to be able to share with one another and be with one another during this time through social media, through um, our website, through all these different technology aspects. I'm so thankful for that. And, uh, and so if you're here this morning, meaning if you are logged in or you're, you're watching this this morning for the first time, if you're a guest here, maybe you've never been to Living Hope, you've never checked us out, uh, and this is kind of your first experience with us. I just want to thank you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for choosing to join us this morning uh, for worship and for our service. Uh, I know this is a little strange, but that's okay. It's, we're adapting and we're using the tools that God has given us, and, and it's awesome. And so uh, the Lord keeps reminding me of a specific scripture, 2 Timothy 1.7, and I've said this repeatedly, but I want to continue to say this, and it's that God has not given us, the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. Guys, don't be, don't be ruled and run by fear during this season. Uh, if you, maybe if you are fearing, feeling fearful, I want to encourage you, you can check out last week's message on our Facebook live. Uh, you can watch the whole service. I talked exactly about that, about overcoming fear. And, um, but again, if you are a visitor with us, thank you. Thank you for choosing to tune in today. Thank you for choosing to be here with us. And uh, I want you to, if you're a guest, man, and even if you're not a guest, I'd love it if you guys would just drop a comment below. Uh, if you're on Facebook right now, drop a comment, say hi, uh, engage with each other. And uh, if you're new, maybe introduce yourself and just let people know, hey, I'm kind of checking this out. And that way you can still get connected with some people in the church. Um, but we have, if you are new here, you may not know that we have just finished up a sermon series, a message series that I have, I had titled The Battle Around Us. And last week, um, not last week, the week before last, uh, was our, our last message in that series. And I hope you guys enjoyed that message series. I certainly did. And uh, I enjoyed studying. We went through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, where in that scripture, Paul talks about um, putting on the full armor of God. And, and what is that? And why do we have that? And so, um, and so we kind of broke that down and went through it piece by piece, week by week, learning about what is the full armor of God. Anyway, I enjoyed the series, and I hope you guys did too. And if you're new, I encourage you to check it out. You can go to our website, www.livinghopealpina.com. And if you go to our website, you can click on the media tab up on the top section there. And on that tab, you can drop it down. A drop down will come, and you can look at the last, I think, three to four years of sermons that we've done at Living Hope Church, and you can listen to the audios on that. So I encourage you to do that. But this week, we're beginning a new series and, um, and it's kind of weird starting a new series online, but that's okay. Um, it's, it's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. But, um, so we're beginning a new series, and we'll, we'll do this series up until uh, Easter Sunday. And, um, and so I'm hoping, Lord willing, that we will be in this building on Easter Sunday. Uh, however, we can't, we can't guarantee that. And so we're preparing as if we won't be. Um, but we're going to be in this series, and I've titled this, this series, We Are Living Hope. You just saw the, uh, the, the testimony or the story of, um, of Tina and Jeff Anderson and how um, God has tra changed and transformed their life. And he's used this body of believers, Living Hope Church, uh, to do that. And so it's so cool that Jesus, the living hope in us, moves through us to change people around us and change us. And so this whole entire series that we're talking about is, um, or that we're starting, is all about our stories. Because let's face it, guys, the reality is, is Jesus tells us that we are to share our faith. That's why he says, go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We're to go out and share our faith. And when you go out and share your faith, Something that people can argue with is a biblical interpretation. People can argue with a theological or a doctrinal position or point. The thing that people cannot argue with 
is the story of a life that has been changed and transformed by the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so uh, that's why we've encouraged, we've been in evangelism class, and up until this whole weird corona stuff has started, we were in an evangelism class every week on Tuesday nights where we were talking about how to practically share our faith and lead people to Jesus. And I, the week prior to our uh, containment <laughs> from each other, our social distancing order, uh, I had given the people in our evangelism class the task of, hey, uh, let's write down our stories. Let's write down the stories of how Jesus has shaped and changed our lives. And the goal is to be able to do that in three minutes or less. But um, anyway, and the, because the truth is, like I've already said, Nobody can argue with life that has been changed or transformed by the message of the gospel. And so this series coincides with that thought. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sharing with you stories of people in this body whose lives have been changed by Jesus here at Living Hope. But we're also going to be going through a specific biblical character every week. And so um, we're going to be highlighting a person in scripture whose life was just changed, radically transformed by God. And we're going to look at how God used them and how their story still speaks to us today. Because, guys, it's important for us to share not only our stories, or not only these stories in Scripture, but also our stories. Our stories are what have shaped us into who we are. Our stories are what uh, mold us into where we currently are. In fact, sharing our story, or as Scripture puts it, sharing our testimony, is an incredibly powerful thing to do. In the book of Revelation, in the epic battle between God and Satan, um, where Satan was cast out of heaven, uh, it says in scripture that it was by, he was cast out by the blood of the lamb. So that's the work of Jesus. Jesus is the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. Um, So it was by, Satan was cast out by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. That's the story of a life that has been changed by the love of God through his son, Jesus. Um, so this week we're going to be discussing a story that is so incredibly powerful. In fact, this is a story that has rocked people's religion. This is a story that has rocked people's idea of who God is and, and what he's doing and what he has done. It's caused people to be in awe at the wonder uh, of, uh, to be in awe and wonder of the goodness and the grace and the forgiveness of God. And so this is a story that is powerful that I would say it's a story that has been divinely put in scripture. I mean, all of scripture is divinely put in there, but this is a story that God put in there for, for us, for all those who, um, who may have these wonders of how do we come to know Jesus? How is he, what is eternal life? How do we have that? And so, um, so today we're going to be going through this man's story of the thief on the cross. And it's found in Luke chapter 23. Now, if you're new here, maybe you're new to this whole church thing and you've never been here um, and you, you, maybe you've never even really cracked open your Bible and you don't know where the book of Luke is. That's okay. It's kind of like middle to the end. It's in the New Testament. And so there's two halves of the, of the Bible, Old and New Testament. It's in the New Testament, and it's the third book of the New Testament. So it goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. And we're going to be in the book of Luke, chapter 23, and we're going to be in verses 32 through 43. Now, um, I want to encourage you, if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you, open up your Bible, guys. Don't just rely on the words that are going to be up here on the screen. Don't just rely on those. I want you to open your Bible. I want you to read this with me. If you don't have a Bible, shoot us a message, guys. Let us know. We'll get you a Bible. Um, So we're going to be in Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. And it begins here. Actually, before I begin reading it, I want to give you a little background. So up to this point, Jesus has lived for 33 years on earth. He has operated in ministry for 33 years, or for three years of those 33 years. And in that ministry, he has shaped people's lives. He's, he's shaken religious thoughts. He's uh, shaped people's thoughts about who God is and changed people's thoughts about who God is. The deaf have come to hear, the blind have come to see, the lame have, have been walking, the poor have good news preached to them. Um, Jesus has done an amazing thing. And now up, now up to this, now he's been accused because, hey, when you speak the truth and the love of Jesus, let's face it, religious people, people who, um, who are stuck in their religion, they get a little, uh, 
I don't know what's the word, rubbed the wrong way, I guess, by the words of Jesus. And so that's what he's done. And, uh, and now these religious people have brought false accusation against Jesus. He's already had his trial. He's been falsely accused. He's been arrested. He's been beaten. He's been bruised. He's had the crown of thorns put on his head. Um, and, and so now he's already carried his cross up to this place called the skull, which was where he was crucified. And so where the story picks up is where, when Jesus was crucified. So verse 32 of Luke chapter 23 says, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. That's Jesus. So, so you have two criminals being put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and said to Jesus, and, I'm sorry, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they, that's the Roman soldiers, cast lots and to divide his garments. So they were gambling for Jesus' clothes. And people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, let him save himself. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over the cross, over him. This read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he, Jesus, said to him, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Guys, there's so much in this story that challenges our beliefs and challenges our thoughts of heaven and eternity. And I'm so excited to get to be able to go through this amazing passage of Scripture with you. But before we do, like always, let's go ahead and pray. And let's ask God just to bless our time together. Would you guys join me? Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your amazing grace today. We thank you that your spirit, the Holy Spirit is with us, speaking to us, comforting us, encouraging us, calling us to repentance. And I pray today as I speak, I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that all of us would have ears to hear and eyes to see your truth today, God. Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, let my words just be um, a conduit of your grace and your mercy today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is the story of two men, one who receives forgiveness, the other who stubbornly, till the very end, refuses it. One got what he deserved. The other got everything he didn't deserve. What is it about this story that's so powerful? What is it about this particular story that has shaken so many people? What is it that is in this story? Why is it that this story, this one, is considered to be one of the most powerful moments in Jesus' ministry before his death? Why, why is that? Normally, when we talk about a person, when I talk about a person, or I share about a specific person, I like to give you um, some historical background or historical context as to who the person is. You know, like, who were they? Where did they come from? Who was their mama? Who was their daddy? You know, like, um, what did they do in their life? And, but the reality is, is that in this passage of Scripture, in Luke chapter 23, in the story of this thief on the cross hanging next to Jesus, I don't have any of that. 
I don't have the ability to tell you who this guy was. I don't know who his parents were. I don't know his background. Um, I don't know his age. I don't know his name. I don't know his ethnicity. I don't know his cultural background. I mean, we could assume most likely he was Jewish, but I mean, we don't really know that. He was in Roman controlled Jerusalem. He could have been anybody. He could have been a Gentile. Um, We don't know anything about this guy. And what's really interesting about the story is that outside of Jesus, there are two key people, two key characters in this story. Two men with two very similar yet incredibly different outcomes in their life. This is the story of two men. And today I'm excited to talk to you about how this story has shaped and changed so many people. So this story is called We Are Living Hope because we've been looking at the stories of how God has moved through us and shaped our people and shaped this church and is constantly using the people of Living Hope to reach our community. And so let's begin looking at this incredible story by looking at the similarities between these two men as they were hanging on the cross on either side of Jesus. So both of these guys, we don't know much about them, but what we do know is that both of them were convicted. Um, we have no, I mean, we have some idea. We, we, you know, he's known as the thief on the cross, so he's probably being crucified for that. He's probably being, being uh, having his punishment is because he was uh, a thief. But, you know, he could have had so many different aspects of his life that led him to this point. So many different things that led him to this point. And uh, in this time of Rome's leadership, Jerusalem, a person could have been sentenced to death for a number of different reasons. Not to mention the fact that Levitical law kind of comes into play too. So, and if you don't, that's like uh, religious law comes into play. And so you have the religious leaders, which are called the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin, and they uh, enact this religious law. And so you have all these different aspects that could have led this guy to this point. But the reality is, is both were convicted. They were convicted criminals that were hanging next to Jesus. Both men mocked and jeered at Jesus. In Mark chapter 15, verse 32, we can read, it says, let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that they may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So it wasn't just simply the one. It wasn't just like there was a good thief and a bad thief. Like both of them were mocking Jesus. Both of them were reviling Jesus. And just like the two criminals being crucified before being transformed by Christ, Scripture tells us that we have all sinned, that we have all fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. Without Jesus in our life, we, like the criminals, we're convicted. We have a death sentence of an eternity without God. Both were condemned to death. What we do know is that both of these men were convicted of crimes under Roman rule that required them to be put to death. They experienced the punishment of death because of their transgressions. Most Roman citizens weren't put to death. We had slaves, prisoners of war, but anybody could have been. These two men were sentenced to death by crucifixion, which is one of the worst ways you could ever possibly imagine dying. And so we have two criminals, both condemned to death, both jeering and mocking Jesus as they were crucified alongside him. And Jesus does one of the most amazing things that you could ever imagine. And in verse 30, um, let's see, verse 34, as his executioners are mocking him, as the criminals next to him are mocking him, Jesus does the unfathomable, the unthinkable, as he's being humiliated and experiencing a painful death. He cries out and says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He prays for them. Guys, what's amazing is it's in that moment. It's in that moment where the forgiveness of God is so on display. It's in that moment that one of the criminal's hearts is opened. His eyes are opened to who Jesus is, because the forgiveness of God is life-altering. The first criminal looks at the second, and in verse 39 through 41, we see his heart change take place as he looks at Jesus. And Scripture tells us, it says, one of the criminals who hanged 
next to him, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And in an instant, in an instant, this guy recognizes Jesus' divinity and his innocence alongside of this contrast of his own selfishness and sinfulness. He confesses that he's a sinner, that he's worthy of the consequences that he's about to receive. You see, guys, as human beings, we are all sinners that are outside of Christ. We all lack what's necessary in order to spend eternity at, in heaven with God when we're outside of Jesus. And the criminal recognizes Jesus' divinity. He recognizes that he's the Messiah, and in an instant, son of God, and realizing his own brokenness, he looks at Jesus, and he has the audacity to say these words. In Luke twenty three forty two, the criminal looks at Jesus and says these words. Remember me. Are you kidding me? Remember you? Remember the fact that you've lived a life that at this point has led you to this place? Remember that you haven't done anything significant or good for humanity. Remember that you haven't done anything good in your life, but you've pursued a life of evil. Remember that you could have had a positive influence and a positive difference in the world, but yet here you are and you made the world a little bit darker with what you did. Is that what you want us to remember? Those are the things that we would expect Jesus, to, maybe not Jesus, but we would expect to say, or, or that we would expect a lot of people might be thinking in that moment. But Jesus does the absolute unthinkable. unthinkable. He does the absolute unfathomable. And he looks at this man and all of his brokenness and all of his guilt and all of his shame. Jesus looks at him and says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus looks at this mess of a man in the middle of his condemnation, in the middle of his literal death sentence for crimes that even by his own admission he did that he deserved it. Jesus looks at him and says, today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. The words paradise is the same word that in the book of Revelation is used for heaven. And so Jesus is saying, I want you to know that today you will be with me in heaven. Imagine the hope, the faith, the love, the joy that this man felt. In, the, in this moment when the realization hits him that while, yes, he's going to take his last breath today, he will be with Jesus in heaven. Jesus takes the broken and discarded things of this world and he transforms them into something beautiful. That is, is the message of the gospel of Jesus. Even in the case of this man, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This man was transformed, saved in a moment. And I think that there are a few things that we need to point out. And we're going to close with this. This guy didn't do anything to get into heaven. You'll hear some Christian traditions tell you that unless you're baptized, you're not going to get into heaven. You're going to have some traditions that are going to tell you unless you, um, you know, pray this specific prayer and you're not going to get into heaven. You're going to hear some tri- tri- Christian traditions say unless you speak in tongues, you're not going to get into heaven. You're going to hear some people say, listen, even if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, if you have sin in your life and you haven't repented of that specific sin, if you die with those unrepented sins, you're not getting into heaven. I want everybody who's hearing me right now, everybody who's tuning in right now to hear this and understand those are lies. 
And they cheapen the death of Jesus. They cheapen the work of Jesus on the cross. I fully believe that this story of this man who was transformed in, in a moment is in Scripture to remind us of the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus. To bring sinners to a place of realization of Jesus' divinity and our sinfulness so that we can realize that without Jesus, we are lost and dead in our sin, but he reaches us where we're at. Whether we're in our office or we're hanging on a cross, Jesus can reach us. There is no place that is too deep or too dark or too sinful for the wonderful mercy of God to reach us. Every person is lost, and because of sin in our life, we are condemned to an eternal separation from God, which is called hell. God says it in Romans 3.23, says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Guys, but Jesus made a way. John, uh, Jesus says in John 14.6, He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Guys, this thief on the cross, this man that was next to Jesus, all he did was surrender his heart to Christ. All he did was say, Jesus, I need you. And in his last breaths, he surrendered his heart and his will, and he received eternal salvation. He was saved from the wages of sin, which is death. Guys, this was a life that was transformed in an instant. Before we pray, as you're here and you're listening to this, maybe you're alone, maybe you're with your family, maybe you're with your spouse. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus, maybe you've done life your own way forever. You, you look at the way you've lived your life and you think, I've done things my own way and I've come up short every single time. Today, you don't have to do things the way you've been doing them anymore. Today, you can experience the love of God. You can be free from the curse of sin, free from the eternal repercussions of sin, You can experience the love of Jesus. Today, if you want to make a choice to be transformed by the message of the gospel, I'm going to say a prayer. And it's not not some magical words or anything. It's just saying, God, I need you. I know I need you. If you're here today and you want to do that, I'm going to pray. And I want you to just repeat after me. Repeat out loud if you want. Repeat in your heart if you want. But I want you to repeat after me. Let's pray. Jesus, I've been living my life my own way for too long. I realize that I need you. I realize that I can't do this life without you. Today, I want to give you my life. I believe Lord, that you lived a perfect life, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose from the grave three days later. I believe that you are God, and I place my trust and my hope in you. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to live a new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that we have been transformed because of your sacrifice on the cross. Jesus, I pray that, Lord, through our life, through our stories, we too would help others come to know and love you, God. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with anxiety or fear because of the coronavirus. Lord, I pray that they would not give in to fear, God. You would give them peace. 
that we would stay connected with one another, as your word says in Galatians, that we would bear one another's burdens. We love you, Jesus. We praise you, God. In the name that's above all names, in Jesus' name, amen. Guys, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Um, Remember, God is bigger than the coronavirus. I want to encourage you, check in on your neighbors. This is a great time for you guys to, um, to live out the Great Commission, to reach those with the love of Christ and to pray for them, to show them the love and the mercy that God offers us. You guys have an amazing week of worship. I'm going to continue to post throughout the week on my personal Facebook page, uh, encouraging updates, words of encouragement, short devotionals, and, uh, and then I'll share those to the Living Hope Facebook page too. But you guys have an amazing week. Um, enjoy the time with your families. Enjoy the time to be able to kind of step back and, uh, and focus on your families and focus on your relationship with the Lord. I love you guys. Have an amazing week. Thank you.